Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you don't know what I do here on my channel, you've never been here before. Here on my channel, I cover true crime content and all of the true crime content that I cover is more on the vintage side. It's all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something you might be into, maybe go down below, hit that subscribe button and maybe quite possibly turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that. I upload. This month we are covering solved cases and this case that I have for you guys is one that was solved last year and the way that it was solved is one of the most insane ways a case has ever been solved that I've personally come across. It's mind-blowing. But before we get into the case, I have to say that today's video is sponsored and it's sponsored by a company I've never worked with before. I'm very excited to work with them on today's video. It is a sponsor for all of the people out there of the legal drinking age and who are responsible drinkers. Today's video is sponsored by Bright Cellars. Bright Cellars is a monthly wine subscription service that matches you with wines from all over the world, specially chosen to fit your palate. You take a quick seven question quiz so they can gather your taste preferences and deliver the most suitable wine just for you. If you get a wine you don't necessarily enjoy that month, their customer service is incredible and we'll take care of that little issue immediately and we'll send you a replacement in your next box no problem with each box you also get little cards that help educate you about the wines with an outline of testing notes suggested pairings for the wines best serving temperature for the wines and its origin they will deliver right to your house every month. No more stopping at the pesky liquor store. Like I said before, you do get little cards about each one of the wines and it just has all of the information on the back. Now Bright Cellars is giving my Gabulosis viewers out there 50% off your first box and your first box has six wines in it. 50% off. All you have to do, go down below in the description of this video, click that link, take your little seven question quiz and you're good to go. I got four red wines and two white wines in my box. This one is my favorite. It's so good. I guess one of the main reasons I wanted to work with them right now is because everything going on in the world, we're trying to not leave our house as much as possible, even though things are, you know, a little iffy. I mean, they deliver directly to your house. And one of my favorite things to do is literally just have a glass of wine and watch some true crime content. So you know, it's appropriate. Thank you so much, Bright Sellers, for sponsoring today's video. And now let's get right into the case. Today, we are going to be talking about the solved case of Bonnie Haim. Bonnie Lynn Pesciuto Haim, born May 20th, 1969 in Scotland. In the year 1993, she was 23 years old and living in sunny Jacksonville, Florida. She was described by her sisters, Liz, Veronica, and Michelle, as a sweet Southern girl. She was a kind soul. They told Dateline NBC that Bonnie absolutely loved shopping, but she loved something a lot more than shopping, and that was her son, Aaron. Being a mother was the thing she loved the most in life. Her son was her everything. She was described as a generous person who always tried to keep the peace. She was never the type of person to cause a problem, get upset, or raise her voice. She loved life, and she tried to live it as happily as she could while she was still here. Right out of high school at 18 years old, Bonnie married her high school sweetheart, a man named Michael Haim. This didn't surprise her family at all. They all thought Michael was the total package, and he and Bonnie were so head over heels for each other. Her mother, Patty, said that overall, she seemed happy. Two years after the wedding, Bonnie had her son, Aaron, the light of her life. Bonnie and Michael both worked for Michael's uncle, Bernie, and Aunt Ivan, who owned a construction supply company named Bernie's, obviously after his uncle, Bernie. Michael was the manager of Bernie's and Bonnie, she was kind of working more on the computers. She had a great knack for working computers. She was also kind of the bookkeeper. That was what she did while she was there, but she was also kind of like assistant manager. Bonnie was a very hard worker and most of the reason that she worked so hard is because she was a mother and she wanted to make enough money to give her son Aaron 
all that he wanted in life, give him the life that she thought he deserved. Everyone who worked with Bonnie really respected her, even though she wasn't the boss or the direct manager, they all respected her and they just adored her. She was such an easy person to work with and she had no known enemies. Nobody disliked Bonnie. So when she mysteriously vanished, it took everyone by surprise. On January 7th, 1993, Bonnie Haim did not show up for work and Michael phoned in sick. The night before, Michael phoned his mother, Carol, at around three in the morning to come by the house and watch Aaron while he went out and looked for Bonnie. He claimed they got into a very heated argument and she left the home at around 11 p.m. He claimed when he went looking for her that one of the first places he drove was by her mother's home to see if her car was parked outside, but it wasn't. Michael was gone about 45 minutes and then he waited around until the next morning, but he strangely didn't phone the police about his missing wife. Also that night before, Bonnie was supposed to get together with Ivan at around 8 p.m. that night, but she called her at 8.30 p.m. crying. She told her that she and Michael were having a discussion and she couldn't come out that night. Ivan asked if Bonnie wanted her to come over and Bonnie said she would be fine and would call her in the morning, but she never did. So right off the bat, Michael looks a little suspicious. And when it comes to Michael and Bonnie's marriage, they were having problems for quite a while. And everyone who knew Bonnie said that Prior to her disappearance, she was planning on leaving Michael. They would get into these huge screaming matches and it never really got physical from what I read, but it was just very toxic and it was really emotionally and mentally depleting Bonnie. She was not the same person anymore. She was a person who was just so bubbly and outgoing and you always hear, you know, the person lights up the room. Like that was Bonnie and she was not that person anymore after a little bit of time in her marriage with Michael. She wanted to get away from Michael and she wanted to take their son, Aaron, with her. She actually went on a Christmas shopping trip with her sister the year before she disappeared and she told her sister that their marriage was over, that she was planning to get away from Michael. By late 1992, she had even opened a secret bank account to start saving money for an escape, but Michael found out about this bank account and made her immediately close it. Without a bank account to keep any money in, she decided to give money to friends for safekeeping. By the beginning of January, she had saved up $1,250. She even knew when she was going to leave. She picked a date in January when Michael would be away on a business trip. She also had put down a deposit on an apartment and even found a school for Aaron. She was ready, she had a plan. She wanted to get away with her son and start over. I'm not entirely sure if she was planning on staying in the Jacksonville area or moving to a different area, but pretty much everyone in her life knew of her plan and they were told to not tell Michael because if Michael knew, who knows how he would respond to that news. On that same day of January 7th, 1993, Bonnie's purse was found in a dumpster behind a red roof inn by an employee at the hotel. In Bonnie's purse were a lone set of car keys. Back at her home, they located another pair of her car keys and a pair of house keys. This hotel was located not far from Jacksonville International Airport, and this airport would be where they located Bonnie's Toyota Camry sitting in the parking lot. One strange thing about Bonnie's car was that the driver's seat was pushed farther back, almost like someone much larger than Bonnie was driving it. If Bonnie herself had been driving it, it would have been very uncomfortable because she was only five foot one. At this point, they were bringing in search teams and authorities to try to locate Bonnie while also talking to Michael. And while they're talking to Michael, things that he's saying are just not adding up. Whether he was the person who was responsible for her disappearance or he knew something about it, they just felt like he was not telling the complete truth 
to them. Nonetheless, they started looking into other theories, other people who may have been involved in Bonnie's life, anybody who looked a little bit suspicious. They did end up finding out that Bonnie at one time had an affair behind Michael's back. They ended up locating this person that she had an affair with and he basically said it was just a one night thing. They didn't really talk afterwards and that he had no involvement in her disappearance. He didn't even know that she was missing. And after police talked to him a little bit of time, they did decide that this was not their person. Other than Michael's story seeming a little bit off, one thing they found while searching Bonnie's car was a shoe print. This shoe print was far too large to be from one of Bonnie's shoes. Coincidentally, when they went to Bonnie's home to question Michael, the first thing they saw when they walked in was a pair of shoes. They were a size 10 pair of Nike blue and white sneakers, and they 100% matched the footprint found in her car. The seat was pushed back and Michael's shoe print was fresh on the floorboard. It looked to many that he was the last person who drove that Toyota Camry but at the time that couldn't be proven for sure. There was one thing about Bonnie that everyone who knew Bonnie knew, and that was that under no circumstance, no matter what happened, she would never ever leave her son, Aaron. They knew that although there were no signs of foul play, they knew that foul play was involved. They knew deep in their hearts, they just had a gut feeling that Bonnie was not somewhere hiding that somebody had done something to her. But you would think that if your significant other, the person you were married to, just vanished, you would need a little bit of time to process everything. I mean, I don't know, I don't know. I'm just saying, personally, yeah, I'd be going through it at the time. I wouldn't have the mental state to be on camera and do an interview, especially not the night after it happened. Well, that's what Michael did. The night after Bonnie disappeared, he went on TV to talk about it. On TV, during this on-camera interview, he did not seem like a man whose wife just mysteriously vanished. His mannerisms were very questionable. During this interview, he actually brought Aaron on screen, which I don't know if it was some sort of tactic to make him look like a caring parent, but to many he did. He did look like somebody who was just talking about his wife's disappearance and trying to get the news out there and had his son there with him, but to others he looked like somebody who was keeping a secret. In this interview though, to basically summarize it, he was just saying that his wife was missing, that she left the house, now it's just him and his son, and you know, his wife wanted to leave and he wasn't gonna stop her. Aaron was only three and a half years old at this time. The main detective on the case, Detective Hinson, was curious what the little boy may remember from the night his mother disappeared. They didn't originally know if he would have anything to say at all, they just wanted to talk with him and see what he might have to say. Since he was so young, they needed someone skilled in the field of talking to children, so they brought in a social worker named Brenda Metters. Bernie and Ivan sat in during the interview to make Aaron feel a little bit more comfortable. Brenda was not told a lot about the case, only the major details, and she sat with the boy for a few hours, and after a bit of time had passed, he started talking a lot more. The things that Aaron was telling Brenda would send shivers down anyone's spine. He said, daddy shot mommy. And according to her, she said, with what? And he said, a gun. And she said, where? And he pointed to his stomach. This young boy literally pointed to his stomach and said, the stomach. And Brenda told Dateline NBC that after that, she asked Aaron, what was mommy wearing? And he said, red blood. Brenda at the time believed wholeheartedly that Aaron witnessed his father shoot his mother, that he was not just making this up. And authorities agreed. They thought that this little boy had witnessed his father shoot his mother 
and that Michael had done something with Bonnie's remains and that Michael was so heartless that he did all of this in front of his son. The statements made by Aaron tore the family apart because some believed what he was saying was true while others believed he was brainwashed by authorities. For instance, Michael's own uncle and aunt who were in the room that day during the interview with Aaron believe Aaron was telling what he saw, while others, like Bonnie's own mother and father, truly believed Michael would have never done such a thing. For part of the interview, Bonnie's mother was in the room, but she wasn't in the room when he told what he saw. She didn't believe he said those things at all, and it wasn't recorded, so there was no legitimate proof to back it up. Brenda, Bernie, and Ivan, though, said he did. It was a game of he said, she said. Getting the boy to say it again was very hard. You have to remember though that at this time, there was no body. There was no evidence of foul play. There was nothing to really go off of. So at this time, Bonnie was still considered a missing person. Also during this interview with Aaron, Aaron did say a few things that were false. For instance, he said that his mommy's car was in the lake. That was not true. Her car was at the airport. So people like Bonnie's parents thought, well, since Aaron was saying things that were false, that everything else he was saying also had to be false. It was something that he was just making up. And a three and a half year old supposed eyewitness is not enough to arrest someone. After Aaron though said what he said, authorities made up their mind that Aaron was not safe living with his father. So they took him out of his custody and Aaron went to live with Bonnie's sister, Liz. He was still able to see his father a couple times a week though. Every time Michael came over to visit Aaron, Aaron threw tantrums. He didn't want to see his father at all. This little boy was traumatized to say the least. Liz had to make one of the hardest decisions of her life and she ultimately decided to put Aaron into foster care because if he was in foster care, all visitation with Michael would be cut off. She didn't want to give up her nephew, but it was the best thing for his mental health at the time so that he might have a chance at a normal life with his father out of the picture. She also had Aaron declared a protective witness, so he was basically put in a witness protection program. At the age of five years old, he was adopted by a couple named Ronnie and Jean Frazier, and they changed his name to Aaron Frazier. As months went on, Aaron started talking a lot more to the point where it was every single day he was saying things about his mother and saying things about his father and telling about what he supposedly saw that night. His adoptive mother, Jean, was such an amazing person and she never wanted to take the place of Bonnie. She never wanted to take the place of his actual mother. She just wanted to take over, be a motherly figure to him and also give him a normal life. At no point was she trying to pressure this little boy into saying anything about anything. Aaron started talking so much that Jean had to start writing it down. He kept saying that his father shot his mother and he would describe the entire incident. He said that he was in the living room when he saw it happened, that his father took his mother's pocketbook to the car, that he didn't want his father to kill anyone else. There were no police there at this time. No one was telling him anything. He was saying this all on his own and kept saying more and more. They decided to record him and he sat down with his new social worker and Jean and he started reading things that he told Jean to write down for him. One of those things was, he buried my mom. We digged it, the hole. Now this next part is something that when I first read it, absolutely gave me goosebumps. At six years old, only six years old, Aaron asked Jean if he could go look for his mother. And Jean obviously didn't know how to respond to this, but she said, you know, okay, okay, Aaron, you can go look for your mom. And he went and grabbed a shovel. This is also something that he did with Detective Hinson, who was the main detective on this case. He would say, can I go find mommy? Can I go look for mommy? And then he would walk over to like the garage or the outside area next to the house and he would get the shovel. It was like he knew his mother was buried somewhere. 
he just didn't know where. In the year 2005, Aaron and his Aunt Liz filed a wrongful death suit against Michael after they legally declared Bonnie deceased. They actually won and the settlement was $26.3 million. But of course, Michael had no money, so they were never actually granted that money. But in that settlement, they were granted ownership of Aaron's family home on Dolphin Avenue, the home where Aaron claimed to have seen his father kill his mother. Everyone got their wish though when it came to Aaron because he had a good upbringing. He got good grades in school and he graduated high school and ended up marrying the love of his life. I mean, he had a really good childhood. The strange thing though is that Aaron doesn't remember being young and saying the things he said. He has absolutely no memory of being three, four, five, six years old and bringing up these stories about his parents and telling authorities and his adoptive parents what happened to his mother. He had no memory of any of this. He still doesn't to this day. The first memories he really has from childhood are when he started living with his adoptive parents. Now, at this time, at an adult, early adult years, his actual biological father, Michael, had moved to a different state and was remarried. In December of 2014, he was living in his childhood home after the recent owners moved out. He originally didn't want much to do with the home, but he decided that he was going to try to bring the house back to life. Everyone who had lived in the home after Michael, but before Aaron, had a lot to say about the home. Most everyone said that the home always had a dark energy surrounding it, and some even claimed it was haunted. Strangely, the lease forbid anyone who lived in the house from owning any dogs or digging up the property at all. Aaron, though, started renovating. In the backyard of the home, there was a pool and a shower that were no longer being used, so Aaron wanted to clear it out. Aaron and a family member started digging up the garden area nearby, and they hit something hard in the ground. It was a concrete slab. They started pulling up the slab and discovered a plastic bag. Aaron ripped open the bag and something fell out. At first, he thought it was a coconut, but upon looking at it closer, he could see teeth and eye sockets. It was a human skull. His mind started racing and he pieced together everything. Within seconds, he thought that he could possibly be holding his mother's skull. After this discovery, after this absolutely horrendous discovery, the first thing he did was he called his adoptive mother, Jean, and he asked her for Detective Hinson's number. When he called Detective Hinson, he said the same thing to him that he had said to Jean, that he found his mother. He was sure that these remains, these skeletal remains, belonged to Bonnie Haim. At first, Detective Hinson thought he was in a dream. He, he couldn't even believe what was going on. And mostly because they had checked the backyard many a times. I'm not entirely sure if they brought in ground penetrating radar or not, but they had checked the backyard and they never found anything. Within pretty much no time after this, they started digging and they ended up digging up her entire skeletal remains. And it wasn't just her remains, they also, you know, found her clothes on her and she still had acrylic nails and also, this is so sad, her wedding ring. They brought back her remains to be tested and the results came back and the remains, in fact, belonged to Bonnie Haim. Aaron, as a young boy, had been telling the truth about what he witnessed that frightful night in his home. Near the body, they also located a 22 caliber shell casing. Michael had owned a 22 caliber rifle. The autopsy revealed she had been shot in the pelvis around the area Aaron had pointed to during his interview with the social worker Brenda Metter so many years earlier. Obviously, after testing her remains, her cause of death was decided to be a homicide. Officials arrested Michael Haim for the murder of his wife, Bonnie Haim, and was extradited back to Jacksonville, Florida. His trial was delayed a few times, but it officially began on April 8th, 2019, 
with many members of Bonnie's family and Michael's own family testifying against him. Michael testifying he was not guilty. Two people who had been in jail with Michael also testified in court, claiming he had confessed to killing her and burying her in his backyard. One of these individuals claimed they even feared for their life while they had to share a cell with him. Prosecutors stated they believed Michael took the life of his wife because he found out she was planning on leaving him. Michael in court, though, simply kept saying he loved his wife and would never have hurt her. He stuck to his original story that she simply walked out. It took the jury two hours to come to a conclusion. On April 12th, 2019, Michael Haim was found guilty of second degree murder and on May 21st of that year, he was given life in prison. So justice was finally served in the case of Bonnie Haim after 26 years. This property had been searched so many times before and they never found anything that looked suspicious until Aaron started digging in late 2014. The case of Bonnie Haim was also featured on the original Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack, and it's one of the original Unsolved Mysteries on that show that has been solved. And when it was finally solved, the person responsible was somebody who was their prime suspect since day one. Through the years, so many people did think that Bonnie Haim maybe just wanted to get out of a relationship so bad with Michael that she just did up and leave. But at the end of the day, it came out that she never did. She never left. She never left her son. I genuinely think one of the craziest things about this case, other than the actual digging up of the yard and finding her remains and it being her son, is the fact that the main eyewitness was Aaron and he was so young when he saw what happened and the main eyewitness being her son is the person who solved her case and he has no memory of it. He doesn't remember anything. And also one of the most mind blowing things about this case is that still to this day, after Michael has been found guilty and Bonnie's remains have been located in the backyard, Bonnie's parents believe that Michael is innocent. Yeah. For everyone else, hearing Michael be found guilty was bittersweet because it was something that they knew all along. It's not like somebody was found guilty and they hadn't heard of this person, they didn't know this person was involved in any way, it's a fresh face in the case. No, most of them knew or had a feeling that Michael had something to do with it. When it comes to Michael, I've read a lot of things online from people who knew him. Some people say that he is just such a nice guy, he would never do such a thing, that it had to be planted in some way, there was no way he was involved in his wife's murder, while other people say that they have known him their entire lives and that he is just not a good guy. Quite a few people online that I've seen in forums talk about him and said that they knew him for a very long time and he always had anger issues. To me, this case is officially declared solved and I just hope that Michael can one day come forward and tell exactly what happened that night because the only other person who knows that is Aaron and he does not remember. One thing personally to me that really sticks out and I guess the only person that knows is Michael unless he told somebody, but that is Bonnie's car. Bonnie's car was located at the Jacksonville International Airport and obviously Michael was the last person who drove it and he drove it there, dropped it off. How did he get back home? Did he take a taxi or cab or like did he call somebody is somebody else involved with this i don't know we know that the night that bonnie was murdered she had talked to ivan on the phone around 8 30 and then of course michael had phoned his mother at around 11. so within that little bit of time is when bonnie was murdered and her car was dropped off at the airport a lot can happen in a couple hours a few hours and i just hope that he can just tell the full story. Aaron told Mary Bauer of News 4 Jax, I don't really feel a whole lot different. 
there's a sense of relief that we don't have to continue to keep fighting the fight. I'm kind of glad that it's over. Even throughout the whole trial process, we've had to come to court every month to six weeks and it just getting dragged through the mud all over again. Having to see him and the other side of the family, just glad that there's some kind of end to this process. When he was asked about how he hopes his story can help others, he said, I hope if there's a woman out there who's in a relationship that's violent, she just needs to get out, especially if there's kids involved. It seems like domestic violence is running rampant in our society. There's all kinds of domestic violence that happens in the home and women are scared to speak up or they're scared to have it impact their lives or aren't sure if they can make it on their own, especially if they have kids and they rely on a male for their financial support. I would just hope that maybe this story would give them the strength to get away from it because it can end up badly. Maybe they can find the strength through Bonnie, what happened to her, to make better decisions for themselves, their lives, and the lives of their children. It doesn't have to be this exact case, but somebody who's struggling with something bad that's happened to them. It could be the death of a family member or anything really, that just you can power through, you can continue your life. The only things that you can control are the decisions that you make and to move forward in any way that helps society and your family. You don't have to let things that happened to you in the past dictate what your future is going to be like. So that is the case of 23 year old Bonnie Haim and like I said at the beginning of this video, the way it was solved is absolutely mind blowing but of course like always with all of my videos. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments because I love reading what you all have to say. And also, like I always say, leave some love down in the comments for any family or friends of the victim who may come across this video. And thank you, Bright Sellers, for sponsoring today's video. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye, guys.